Galatians 6. Before we get reading that, verses 11 through 18, uh, what is the most amazing thing in the world to you? Or maybe you don't want to think about it to you, but what's the most amazing thing in the world to some people? Any ideas? What's the most amazing thing in the world? What do you think some people think is the most amazing thing? Birth of a child. Huh? Birth of a child. Oh, yeah, that's an incredible thing. Yeah. Sunset. Sunset. Willie likes the sunset. Having, having a personal relationship. Oh, yeah. Amazing thing. Yeah. So we're, we're believers. I think we're staying it from the standpoint of a believer. What would be the most amazing thing maybe to a worldly person? Computers, electronics, the, the, the information age, just everything at your fingertips. Yeah, to some people, that's incredible. Fishing? Yeah. You know, I don't know what's going on. I go on YouTube, and all these fishing videos come up. I watched one fishing video, and now I get hundreds of them yeah. every day. I'm like, I don't want to watch fishing every day. What else? Food. Yeah, that can be amazing. I, I was thinking, you guys are getting really, you guys are getting really good this morning. I was thinking much more generally, like, I put money. Isn't that, to some people, the most amazing thing for people that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, to some people, money means happiness. Money means power and influence and, and political power and, you know, I was thinking more general, and you guys are getting really good here, but um, for some people it's not money, for some people what do they talk about? It's education. Well, I need education, and the world needs education, and we'd do better if we, we had more education, and people were smarter, and, and other people it's more hobbies, or, or goals, or passion, and, and, and Christians really... We should have one thing that's the most amazing thing, one thing that is our passion. Obviously, the glory of God, God himself, love for the Lord. Uh, but these verses right here this morning are going to direct us towards another area of, of loving God. It's actually going to talk about glory in the cross of Christ. And, and maybe that's not something we think about sometimes, and, and Paul's going to direct us towards that. So, starting in verse 11. So see with what large hands I have written to you with my own hand. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. For not even those who are circumcised keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but a new creation. And as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Brother, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So as we read these verses, obviously they are about the cross. They're emphasizing the cross. And Paul's saying it's, it's just a hugely important symbol in Christianity. But yet there's folks that will push the cross aside in favor of other things. And he, he lists a few of those other things. Uh, of course, some people maybe have a necklace with a cross on it, or different churches have a cross on the wall. Uh, they have the image of the cross, but, you know, the reality of the cross, sometimes they push that aside. And this verse, like I say, it tells how people do that. And uh, I think when we do that, it, it makes you kind of an enemy of the cross. When you're, you're pushing it aside, you're against the cross, you're against the church. And, um, you know, I think Paul explained to us under inspiration of the Holy Spirit how important the cross is, not just in this passage, but in other places. I have 
1 Corinthians 2.2, 2, as soon as I say it, you'll remember it. I am determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ, Him crucified, right? That's a fairly familiar verse, so um, that, that should be who we are. That should be an emphasis in our preaching and teaching, and even what we're talking about often is the cross. So I think in this passage, Paul is prompting us to examine our thoughts and hearts and motives. You know, if there's things other than the cross that we are pushing or exalting, then we're miss, we've missed the boat. Because uh, God forbid that I should boast except for in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's verse 14 there, a very, very important emphasis that the Paul is wanting on himself and wanting us. So verse 11 there, he says that he wrote, write it, wrote this with large letters so that the churches would remember it, so that the believers would see it. And, and he's telling us we must focus on the cross of Christ, preaching on the cross of Christ. Um, and if we don't, like I say, we're, we're enemies of the church. So there's four enemies of the church that Paul lists here. Number one is the braggarts. That's verse 12. It says, There are folks who desire to do what? Make a good showing. You see that in the verse? There are some folks that desire to make, put on a good show. Now, what do they want to put on a good show? In what area? What's the prepositional phrase there? In the flesh. In the flesh, right? So, uh, there's nothing wanting to... For instance, put on a well-done uh, worship service in church where, you know, I'm sure Dick, when he led worship, he was well-prepared, right? He wanted to be right. There's nothing wrong with being a, a well-done, rehearsed, polished, but not for yourself, right? For, for God's glory. So you want to do that in the spirit. Uh, what Paul's talking about right here is wanting to put on a good show in the flesh. I think that's the, the point of the verse. And, and what happens when you want to put on a good show in the flesh? What, what is that? What is that sin? Pride. Yeah, pride creeps in. And, and pride uh, can, can touch, I think, aspects of a worship service in church. Or it can even touch giving, right? Uh, we're, we're in some of the Pharisees prideful even in their giving. Matthew 6, take heed that you do your charitable deeds before men, not to be seen by them, otherwise you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. Therefore, when you do a charitable deed, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory from men. Surely I say to you, they have their reward. So pride can creep in, not just, you know, with singing or, or playing an instrument or giving or or fasting. Remember some of those guys, they were like fasting and putting on this show in the flesh, right? Now when we're talking about singing, worshiping, fasting, giving, are those good things? They're good things, right? But they can be ruined by the desire to put on a good show in the flesh. That's pride, that's boasting. So Paul says, hey, verse 14 once again, most important verse in this section of verses. Paul says, the only thing I want to boast in, the only thing really worth talking and really bragging about is the cross of Christ. All right, so, uh, you know, I think, I think we know that. Um, but, you know, we can ask that question, what is your boast? What are you most pr proud about? You know, some people, it's their house. You ever met anybody like that? They boast about their house. Some people it's their education. Some people it's their uh, degree on their wall or their, their job or their accomplishment. For other people, well, it's their connections. You know, I know all these people. Have you ever met anybody like that? They start name dropping. Oh, I know this person. I know that person. Um, you know, people walk around, they highlight their best attributes and their their abilities, their track record, their experience. For other people, maybe it's their family. The first thing they 
brag about as their family. And that's a good thing to have a good family, a bunch of grandchildren, very good thing. You know, but Paul says, hey, are you going to boast about the cross of Christ? You know, that he says, he says that's his true boast in life. That's the only thing he really wants to talk about. I mean, that, that's his answer to everything is the cross of Christ. Without hesitation, it's, it's the cross. To him, nothing else mattered. And everything else, what is everything else in comparison in this passage? It's, it's useless in comparison. Listen to this, Philippians 3, another uh, verse by Paul. Philippians 3, it says, and yet, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. I count them as rubbish or garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. So, you know, all the things that we typically highlight and exalt and boast about, they're all rubbish. In light of eternity and the cross of Jesus Christ. So when we put these verses together, I'm not sure we can ad I can adequately convey the importance of the cross of Christ in comparison to the way Paul did it here. You know, it just beautifully tells us that he doesn't want to boast in anything, but the cross of Christ. That's why it's it's so important. It's it's so important. Uh, <clears throat> now, the cross. One of the reasons why it's so important is it's a sign of victory. Uh, because what did what did Christ gain victory over the at, at the cross? Sin, and then the resurrection, victory over death. Right. So it was the complete picture between those two: the cross and the, and the empty tomb. Uh, victory over sin and victory over the grave, right? And, and that's what we should be taking pride in. That's what we should be talking about because we have victory and Satan has lost. But yet sometimes it seems like we give Satan victory in, our, in areas. Uh, so we have to talk about the cross of Christ and his victory over death. We don't take pride in our abilities. Take pride in Christ, his death and resurrection. You know, one of the reasons we don't take pride in our abilities, what, what could happen to those abilities? Right, right? They could be gone in, in a heartbeat. I remember one of my really good friends, one of my mentors, um, a pastor, an older pastor, and he had been preaching for over 50 years, and he went into the doctor, and he had something wrong with his throat, his vocal cords. And the doctor said, I'm going to do this procedure, but if you flinch, if you move at all, it could take away your ability to speak. And that would take away one of his greatest assets, right? His speaking ability. It could be gone like that. So all of our abilities, all of our accomplishments could be gone. So the Apostle Paul, he understands this. So he refuses to take pride in his abilities or his accomplishments. And, and that's strange to us because that's typically what we take pride in. But he says, I only want to boast of the cross. Now sometimes I, you study this and read that and you think about that. And it's embarrassing to me because um, I don't do that very well. Right? I don't boast on the cross. You know, the, the founder uh, of our church, Jesus Christ, was executed and arrested. Arrested and executed like a common criminal. Right? Convicted and executed. That's the, the foundation of our church. And most people would try to cover something like that up. Don't they? Like if you have some family member in your past that did something, you don't talk about it, you would cover that up. But what are Christians supposed to do? Boast about it. I mean, this seems kind of convoluted or backward, but um, we're supposed to brag about it, highlight it, talk about it, shout it from the rooftops that Christ died on the cross. And, 
And uh, um, I think what Paul was trying to convey is the cross. I, I, I don't think I came up with the statement. I think I read it. <laughs> it's too good for me. The cross isn't something to boast about. It's the only thing to boast about. Because it means God loved us enough to die for us. It means that Christ paid the price. He paid the penalty for our sins. And because of the cross and his subsequent victory over death, just a short time later, the cross means we can have forgiveness. The cross means God's wrath has been absorbed and abated because of Christ. So we don't should never be boasting about ourselves and we need to remember what we are. We're hell-deserving sinners. But it was the cross that changed that. And uh, really, the cross changed more than us. It changed the whole world. It turned everything upside down. So that's what we boast about. That's all Paul's saying. So, you know, we have to ask ourselves when we read this passage, we have to review it. Do we boast in Christ and the cross? Maybe here's a better way to put it. Do you ever talk about the cross of Christ? Ever? Does verse 14, look at it again, does that, does that challenge you at all? God forbid that I should boast in anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, so as pastor, I hope and pray that everyone who walks through the doors is, number one, born again. Uh, and secondly, I hope we're giving glory to God. Uh, I hope we're looking for that. Uh, glory to God in verse 12 uh, you know examine your motives um, and see if we are boasting in the cross of Christ or seeking to receive the praise of men and I, I think that's very important the cross of Christ is most important a woman from the funeral home was up the other day we were picking out the leaflets, you know, that are given out at the funerals, and I was going through the different ones, and I came to one that had Christ on the cross, and I said, oh, I don't want that one, that's Catholic, because we don't believe in Christ being on the cross, so we think he's alive. Yeah, oh, good, that was good, you ministered and witnessed, yeah, that's a good way, good segue into talking about Christ isn't on the cross anymore. Right? The penalty has been paid. Yeah. When my foreign exchange student asked me, she says, well, how is our religion different than yours? Because she's Catholic. And I said, well, for one thing, we don't put up Christ on the cross. Uh-huh. Yeah. He's a lot. He's a lot. And she just said, oh, and walked away. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, whenever it was in England, there was this brand new church that was built. Rock and brick and stone, just a beautiful structure. And in the brick or the stone or however it was, it was in huge letters, we preach Christ crucified. Well, after 10, 20 years or so, some ivy grew up the building and it covered up crucified. So when you're walking by on the road, it just said, we preach Christ. And after another decade or so, uh, the ivy kept growing and all it said was, we preach. Well, if all we're doing is preaching or singing or chit-chatting or whatever, if any of that is done without the cross of Christ, you know, Without Christ, without the cross, everything would be meaningless, everything would be worthless, it would just be talking. You know, we're, we're really doomed without Christ paying the penalty for our sin on the cross. So that's what we boast about. That's what we are loud about, that's what we push on people. It's not ourselves, it's, it's the cross of Christ and Him crucified. And if we don't, uh, Paul says, wow, you're, you're in trouble. It's, the church is going to be in trouble. There's going to be this air of pride in the church without the cross of Christ, without boasting in that. And, and really, we're going to fail without that. So, pretty important uh, verse here. 
Another enemy of the church is that Paul exposes. First is the braggarts. Second is the bullies. And I don't think I came up with that either. Did you get the alliteration? Braggarts, bullies. Some people like to do that. Uh, but uh, as a desire to show, uh, he says there's some that want to show, have a good showing in the flesh. And what are they going to do? Look in that verse. What are they going to get these people in this church to do? They desire to have a good showing in the flesh. What are they going to do? Compel you to do something. They're going to compel you to do something. There was people in the Galatian church that were compelling others to conform to a certain set of external standards. Now the funny thing is here it sometimes ties in with our current world because uh, isn't there people in this world that are bullying people to uh, comply with a medical procedure? Uh, and compel here isn't, hey, you know, do it if you feel like it. Compel here is coercion. The, 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 the phrase in here isn't like, oh, if you don't do this, you know, it's okay, it's not a big deal. It's compel here is uh, almost a threat. You got to do this. It's being very heavy handed. It's not like it's a sales pitch. It's an emotional plea. You need to do this. And essentially what was going on in this church in the Galatian churches, they were bullies. They were pushing an external standard instead of what? The cross of Christ. And Paul says, hey, that's a problem. Like I said, there's nothing wrong with wanting to look nice. Of course you want to look nice. But... It seems like some of these people were relying on circumcision as part of their salvation. Uh, a work, an outward work, means that we push salvation by grace through faith into the realm of human effort. But God's salvation, we know, and we keep talking about this all morning, right? True salvation solely leans on the cross of Christ. Now, Satan has a counterfeit version because he counterfeits everything, and it always includes works. Now, there might be some grace mixed in, or there might be something mixed in, but works is present, and whenever works is present, the cross is diminished. Now, a lot of these other religions, uh, Mormonism, Islam, uh, they're all works-based. And we've talked about this before. I'm sure you've heard pastors and preachers talk about this a lot of different times. Uh, but Muslims are working their way to heaven. Uh, what do Muslim women have to wear? These coverings, burqas or uh, head coverings. Um, now, that's here in the States and that's in the Middle East, right? Uh, what about, um, uh, if you want to be sure, you're a man in, in the Muslim religion and you want to be sure, you want to go to heaven, you want to make sure you go to heaven, how do you do that? Kill infidels, right? Kill infidels. And, and they, do, they do that. Uh, see, if you read the Quran at face value, and I want to treat the Quran fairly. I want to interpret it literally. I don't want to read into it because I want people to do that with the Bible. So I want to treat the Quran fairly because I want people to treat the Bible fairly. So if you take the Quran at face value, the surest and quickest way to guarantee your spot at heaven is to eliminate infidels. That's non-believers. So that's all these jihadists are doing, right? They're killing people. Uh, they throw gay men off the roof and they lock people up in cages and, and put fires under them and they sell women into slavery. That's all, it's all a works-based salvation. That's all it is. But what's non-existent in the Muslim religion, the cross of Christ. It's a works-based salvation. They bully people into works. There's other works-based religions. Jehovah's Witnesses, there's uh, a bunch of things you can't eat or drink. I think I mentioned that in, in Big Church a couple weeks ago. Just eating at McDonald's can get you thrown out of the church. 
How many would admit that you would have lost your salvation a long time ago if you were a Jehovah Witness, right? <laughs> Just eating at McDonald's, right? Uh, the, 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 list of, the list goes on and on, you know, Christian science, Scientology, even, even you mentioned the Roman Catholic Church, uh, works-based religion in, in many cases. And what's interesting about all these religions, if you study them, and, and Helen borrowed a book one time that went through all these religions, if anybody wants to borrow it, you, you certainly can. They all claim to have a supernatural beginning. Now some say, well, we got our religion from an angel, or uh, it's kind of the way it's described, it's like some kind of an alien or something, so it's a demon, demon, not an angel, but... Uh, Mormonism was given to Joseph Smith by an angel named Moroni. Islam claims to come from the angel Gabriel. Jehovah Witnesses says they came from angels. Christian science uh, was from a lady that said she got a special message. Scientology was delivered by an angel to this L. Ron Hubbard. The Roman Catholic Church, they claim that they have extra biblical information from Mary uh, that came to some of the popes and some of the saints. Yet, all of these religions are false because they contradict salvation by grace through faith and the cross of Jesus Christ. They push human effort, they push good works, and they compel people to a certain set of standards or criteria. Now they will mix in a little bit of grace but anything that diminishes from the cross of Christ takes it away. Now, I think there is a temptation. That's why Paul talks about it. I think there's a temptation for us to turn salvation into something other than the cross. Now, these people in the Galatian church, they were pushing circumcision was necessary for salvation. So, naturally, if you believe that that was necessary for salvation, what would they want people to do? Get them all done, right? They're compelling people to do it. Now some people think prayer or walking the aisle is necessary for salvation. So what are those churches going to get people to do? They're going to compel people to walk the aisle. I know, I know one guy I work with, he says you have to be baptized to be saved. So what are they going to get people to do? You got to get baptized. You got to get baptized. The tank stays full. They're baptizing people every other Sunday, probably. Right? But any work, relying on any work for salvation, we're just as bad as Islam. It's the cross of Christ. It's faith. Grace. Cross is the only way. Ceremony won't work. Works won't work. Our only hope is the cross of Christ where Jesus paid the penalty for our sin. And we have to remember, like, especially when we were talking about it last week, there was two thieves that died next to him. Those guys died too, the same day, the same way, on the cross. So it's not like just that Christ died, it's he died for you and for me to rescue us. He took our place. Uh, I think I said it last week, didn't I? Christ, in that three hours when it went dark, he paid our eternal penalty in hell in that three hours. That's what he did. He took our place. When we should have died, he died. And yet, Paul says there's some people that will compel you to do an external work. Very, very dangerous. But the verse continues. Um, braggarts, bullies, and apparently we couldn't come up with another B. It's uh, cowards. As many as desire to make a good showing in the flesh, these would compel you to be circumcised, only that they may not suffer persecution for the cross of Christ, right? There's just some people, they don't want to suffer. They're just cowards. They don't want to talk about the cross because they want to avoid persecution. Isn't that what the verse says? Simply telling people about Jesus and the cross, uh, telling people that they are a sinner and they need Jesus Christ, they need to be saved, being bold, talking about the cross might mean that you get some persecution. Now, in our world today, it might mean that you just lose a couple friends or you might get laughed at. 
But if you go to Nigeria, where Stephen's at, you might get kidnapped and killed. In Iraq, you might be beheaded for standing up and talking about the cross of Christ. So uh, Paul's just reminding us once again that there's some people that are like that, but we should never shy away from talking about the cross of Christ and telling people that they need a Savior. Now, I'm not going to lie to you. Sometimes that's difficult, isn't it? Telling people that they're messed up and that they need salvation, that they're sinners on their way to hell, sometimes that's not uh, the greatest conversation to have. But how do we end the conversation? God's grace is available. God will forgive anyone that asks. You know, so we, we have to be aware of that. So, braggarts, bullies, cowards, and there's a fourth enemy that is mentioned. And that is, uh, uh, where is it? What verse? Maybe I didn't read it in this passage. It was in the other passage. But it's, Hypocrites, verse 13. The people who are compelling you to be circumcised, what are they doing? In verse 13. Huh? They're glorying in the flesh, yeah, but look at verse 13. They're compelling you to be circumcised who aren't circumcised and keeping the law themselves. Isn't that crazy? They want you to do it, but they're, they're not doing it themselves. So let's get down to verse 16. <clears throat> as many as walk according to this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Um, so Paul loves the church. He has a few very pointed things to say to them right here at the end about these are things I don't want you to do. I want you to boast in, in Christ. But you can see he really does love the church. Um, some people say, especially in Galatians, there's some of these commentators that say Paul's too mean. Um, but uh, he is focused on the cross of Christ, and he cares about the church. He wants them to focus on the cross of Christ. And, uh, you know, last week we said in, in, in the service that the cross of Christ is the turning point in history. It's the place where peace and mercy were brought upon the earth and, and the, the veil of the temple was ripped. And, and we can access God now because of that. So Paul, all he's saying, maybe you think he's mean. Ah, look at this. He's really ripping on these people. He had to even print it really large. And what does that mean? When you type in all caps, what does that mean on the internet? You're screaming at him, right? So Paul is using an ancient form of screaming. He wrote it in large letters, but... He does care about these people, and he wants them to focus on the cross of Christ, Bo boast on the cross of Christ, right? Because Paul knows that one day we will stand before Jesus. Do you really think he was screaming, or do you think that it was because his eyesight was so bad he had to write larger letters so he could see it? I think that, but if I think what I'm trying to say is when people read that today, that's what they think. You know, like when people type on big letters today, they think it's yelling. Well, yes and no, because in the business I work in, everybody types in large letters, and they're not screaming at each other, they're just too lazy to put the cap box on. <laughs> <laughs> and it could be that, too. <laughs> yeah. But why would he mention it? Like, if I'm writing some, like, why would he specifically say it? That's the curious thing. I don't, because, what? once again, because of his eyes, you mentioned that earlier in the book about him having in the flesh, which if you go back to when he was on the road to Damascus, he was blinded. He was blind for several days. Even though he got his eyesight back, I'm sure he still had eye problems the rest of his life. But was the whole book, I guess this is my question, maybe, uh, maybe you and I are, are differing on this. Was the whole book printed in large letters, or was just this Verse 11 through 18. I think he's making mention of the entire letter that he's writing. So the whole letter is written in big print. Yes. Gotcha. See, I was I was under the impression it was just this last bit. Isn't that mentioned in another passage too? That he's writing in large letters. Yes. Yeah. 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 In one of the other letters yeah. to the other yeah. churches. I see 
that as a good example for young people, you know, the screaming at him, yeah, because I think he was probably would, but um, I think a lot of it is better to do it with large. And, and Lyle, it's interesting, when I'm reading things on the internet, people get mad. You're in all caps, quit screaming. And then somebody wrote, my caps lock was stuck on, or, <laughs> or somebody else will say, you know, so we all have a different perspective on that, what, what it meant, um, for sure. But like I say, it's some, I read in one of the commentaries, they were kind of criticizing Paul. He's screaming at him. He's really after him because he wrote it in large letters, and and that may not even what that may not even be the correct interpretation. I'm just saying that's what somebody said. Some people think Paul's mean, but I think when you read verse 16, he loves the church. He says, "Peace and mercy be upon you." And and yeah, so I don't think he is screaming at the church. He loves the church, but. Uh, that's the way some people take it. Look but at he, verse 10. Yeah. He says, uh, when you have the opportunity to do good to all, especially in the household of faith, and look, I'm writing you in my own hand. Uh, did they have scribes? And he's saying, hey, this is effort for me <laughs> to take the time to write to you because the verse above says, take the time. Yeah. Because there was other books that he had people write, and he just signed it at the end, right? So, I have another quick question for you. Go ahead. The last phrase of that, uh, and it says, "Be on them and the mercy and upon the Israel of God." <laughs> Usually, it's the God of Israel when you see that in the throat of scriptures. But is that something different? The Israel of God. Now that you bring it up, and I read it just then, I it. it and my mind stuck out too, and I don't remember in my reading if there was any comments on that. I'd have to look that up really quick and I'm see if anybody. At that my, time. Mine says Gentiles converts had no need to be Jews in the flesh. They were already Israelites in the truest sense of the term because they were in Christ out of Romans 9, 6, 1 and 1 Corinthians 10, 18. So it's some, it was some phrase that was trying to communicate to the Gentiles? Yeah. Okay. But uh, to go back to when the, my, my Bible says, the large letters may have been due to a failing eyesight, chapter 4, verse 13 through 15, but more likely they were used to emphasize Paul's concern and love for the Galatians. Some scholars believe that up to that point, Paul was dictating the letter, but here took the pen himself to write his final personal greeting. Yeah, so that's what I was trying to uh, say, that some people think he just wrote the last section of it, and that was the only part in large letters. But definitely when you read it, it seems that there's no necessarily an indication of that. He could have wrote the entire thing. In large letters but yeah so we can get isn't it neat the Bible is neat we can really dig in and look at things but and maybe he knew there was a lot of elderly people that was going to read and they need a letters <laughs> yeah yeah well and and they were going to need it on um, people copying it yeah. you know it's, he invented large print yeah <laughs> <laughs> people and people it's easier to uh, copy manuscripts when they're larger type so mm -hmm. anything else any other thoughts we, we're basically done I have a question go ahead I've been seeing this ad on television one way and I forget what it's advertising but I'm just wondering it doesn't say anything about a church or anything but isn't I don't. What channel are you watching? Sounds like a vitamin. What channel are you watching? I can't hear you. What channel are you watching? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> What's the programs on the channel? <laughs> it's just an it's just an advertisement. 
and it gives the phone number to call, but I'm wondering if it is of that, that group, Mormons? That group, the last one in the book that you gave me. Julie, take one way. I don't really watch regular TV very much, so I've never seen that commercial. American Band. <laughs> <laughs> it was probably the channel where the tigers are on. <laughs> well, they're probably saying one way to Little Seizures pizza. <laughs> and that's Tiger Game. Don't they only have Little Seizures commercials? Yeah. <laughs> There's only one pizza to buy. <laughs> Every time I see it, though, I wonder if it isn't that. And I've forgotten what they advertise, but I think it's some kind of help. The Mormons do have a lot of advertising. Uh, the Mormons, uh, there's some very, very rich, there's billionaire Mormons, and they're able to give money, and they have billboards, they have websites, they have a lot of advertisement on YouTube, uh, the TV. Uh, they've been running commercials like that since I was a little boy. I remember, you know, Jesus witnessed to the Native Americans. It's in the Book of Mormon. Call the Latter-day Saints and you can get your free copy. And I remember as a little boy, like, Jesus went to the Indians? What? So, yeah, it's probably them. Are those big black billboards with scripture on them beyond when are they still there there used to be big ones that there would be there might have been like six of yeah, them or more yeah. are they still there yeah i haven't well, seen them in a while we've seen them in different places though. but we've seen them on the west side but not lately yeah i haven't seen those around flint lately Let's close in prayer. Father God, we're just thankful that Christ died on the cross. That the, the penalty for sin was paid. We're thankful that all we have to do is go to you by faith and, and that, that debt is covered by Christ. And uh, we're thankful for Paul and uh, the way he did write it with big letters. And we're thankful that your spirit uh, protected this book for us so that we can look at it and uh, lots of different interesting things here. And Father, this week, help us to be boasting in the cross of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.